So the session this evening is on right and wrong. And the Christian life, one way to say it, the Christian life is, well, doing right and avoiding wrong. And for many, what is or was right and wrong used to be very, very clear. But unfortunately today, that is no longer the case. Now, right has become wrong and wrong has become right. And you see this in the culture of death, divorce, euthanasia, abortion, total population control, homosexual relationships, where not so long ago, a few decades ago, uh, all of these were deemed to be just wrong, not acceptable. But today they're very much acceptable. And we're not just talking of pagans, we're talking of uh, who, of course, when they accept these things, are just baptized pagans. And you, we, we see that there is a double standard in today's world, in today's uh, culture. Almost everyone would say, murder is wrong. But then abortion is all right. How can that be? <laughs> is that not clear that that's the murder of the it's even worse because that unborn child, innocent, helpless, supposed to be in the safest place in the world, which is the mother's womb. So, so how can you justify that? Almost everyone thought before that fornication was wrong, but now it's so very, very widespread. Uh, for, for many, including so-called Christians, it is the norm rather than the exception. And unfortunately, even within the church, our church is giving in more and more to the culture of the day. Because if it was just the world out there, but for our church, it's clear what is right, what is wrong, then fine. Okay, the world out there, that's the world out there. But this is us, the people of God. But unfortunately, that also is not so. We're giving in to the culture. Uh, for example, LGBT, uh, greater acceptance. And it seems that today, uh, even within the church, there is what you might call a new morality. Morality is being redefined. And again, right has become wrong and wrong has become right. So, in this talk, I want to take a look at uh, a number of aspects that uh, today is not that clear in the church and, and in church uh, teaching. So this is causing confusion. But of course, as the people of God, we need to know what is right and what is wrong. So, okay, let, let me go on. I actually have uh, 13 points. Uh, the first is about being in the world. Now, it's right to be in the world. It's wrong to be of the world. Now, this is something that uh, we, we hear all of the time. Uh, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. But we, we need to understand that a little bit more. God, God created a wonderful world. And, and this wonderful world was designed for human beings, for, for, for us, for, for, for people. Uh, we actually read in Isaiah 45, verse 18, For thus says the Lord, the creator of the heavens, who is God, the designer and maker of the earth who established it, not as an empty waste did he create it, but designing it to be lived in. And who would live in it? Of course, the animals are there, but basically uh, the, the uh, apex of God's creation, and that is uh, human, human beings. And then we read in the book of Genesis that when God created the world and God created uh, our first parents, God gave Adam and Eve dominion. So in effect, he gave, gives uh, uh, um, his people uh, dominion over his creation. You, you see that in Genesis 1 verse 28, have dominion over the fish of the sea and, and so on and so forth. You take care of my creation. 
In effect, that's what God is saying. And in fact, we read in Psalm 8, verses 6 to 7, talking about uh, humanity, Yet you have made him little less than a god, crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him rule over the works of your hands, put all things at his feet. Okay? So this creator God, all-powerful, omnipotent, made the universe uh, so amazing, but now offers this to humanity saying, uh, you, 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 you take care of it of this uh, uh, world no and 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 uh, also when we talk about humanity and and the world uh, as far as Jesus is concerned he also sent us into the world to do mission so so there's a world uh, humanity is supposed to take care of it but we know what has happened, and darkness and sin has come in, uh, and, and uh, Jesus came into the world to restore us uh, to God, and then he sends us into the world uh, to do mission. Uh, we read in John 17, verse 18, where Jesus says uh, to the Father uh, in his uh, final prayer before his passion, as you sent me into the world, so I sent them into uh, the world so we are people on mission you know? first originally take dominion take care of uh, my creation uh, but now jesus has come uh, he did his work what he needed to accomplish to win for us our salvation and now he says okay just father sent, sent me now i send you you go and continue with uh, the mission you know? so it is right for us to be in the world. But again, uh, we are not to be of the world. Even though we're here and Jesus himself sends us here, we actually do not belong here. Uh, we, we, we see in John 17 verse 14, they do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. Jesus is saying, I am of heaven. And, and here, uh, the, the, the people, uh, they also do not actually belong here. And, and we know that. We're, we're just passing through. We are pilgrims. We're hopefully making it to our eternal home, which is heaven. That's where we really uh, belong. But Jesus has sent us into the world. And so, you know, God probably could just uh, take us out. Okay, it's a, it's a world of darkness and evil. We don't belong here anyway. God just take us out, bring us all to heaven. No, but uh, there's a mission to be done. So he does not take us out. He's, Jesus sends us into the world, but asks for the protection of God upon us. In John 17, verse 15, Jesus prays, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Okay, so we are in the world and we are in the midst of darkness and evil, and we are assaulted by the enemy, but Jesus prays for our protection from the evil one. So, God's focus is on man. With, with creation, the apex of his creation, a little less than the, uh, the, the angels, no? so God's focus is on, on man, but in the world today, the whole aspect of uh, modernism that looks to the well-being of man, but at the expense often at the righteousness of God. So, uh, people might say, modernists might say, well, God focuses on man. God uh, gives man dominion. God uh, 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 created this wonderful uh, creature, uh, humanity. So why can we not focus on man as well? Well, uh, there, there's a big difference because God can focus on man, but man cannot focus on man. Because when we do that, we lose God. God is God. So he says, okay, man, I created man, uh, uh, the apex of my creation, so I focus on him, he's given dominion. And that's fine. We are important. 
in, in the sight and in the plan of God. But if we ourselves now say, okay, our focus is on ourselves, and more and more we look to ourselves and we uh, at times ignore the precepts of God, then we, we lose God. So we see that it is right to value man because of the inherent dignity as being a creation of, of God, but it is wrong if man is at the center. Man is not at the center. It is God who is at the center. So that is the place of God. We cannot usurp the place of God. Okay, a number of aspects that uh, in relation to, to sinners. So the second aspect, uh, looking, looking uh, to sinners. It is right to accept, welcome, embrace, accompany sinners, but it is wrong not to talk of their sin. So the problem today, we've talked about this a number of times, uh, what is called political correctness. And uh, well, my, my simple definition for our purposes of political correctness is precisely when you uh, accept, embrace, uh, accompany, uh, uh, welcome uh, anyone and everyone, especially the sinners, and never speak about their sin. Why? Because it is offensive. You don't want to hurt people. You just want to be nice to them. Just accept them. Let's let's come be 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 together. So that that is a problem, because if you don't speak of the sin, then the sinner remains in his sin. In fact, he is confirmed in his sin. I see, they welcome me. They embrace me. And, and uh, they're not talking about uh, my sin, so they accept me as, as I am. And if we're talking of grievous sin, then ultimately, if the person does not repent, we know what happens. He loses his soul. And so such acceptance, poli politically correct acceptance, is actually not mercy. It is false mercy. Because false mercy does not bring someone back to God, but... Uh, because of actions that, you know, on, on, on the human point of view, wow, they're so nice, they're so accepting. But uh, if you lose your soul, then that is uh, false mercy. So we've always said that the principle, the, uh, according to the church, has always been that uh, we are to love the sinner, but hate the sin. In loving the sinner, you don't gloss over the sin. You don't cover up the sin. Uh, you don't ignore the sin. Uh, simply because talking about it will be offensive to the person. No, you, you love the sinner, and precisely because you love the sinner, you hate the sin. Now, the, the church has been described as a uh, field hospital. And I think that's, that's a wonderful uh, description. Uh, it is for people who are ill, who are afflicted. So that, that's uh, correct. But... When you bring someone to the hospital who is in serious illness, what do you expect the hospital to do? To work at curing the illness. Do, do we just bring someone to the hospital and, and, you know, the hospital staff, they're so nice, and they assign uh, a, a nurse in particular who looks in on you every, every hour, and you get fed uh, with good things uh, and all of that, but never treat your illness, your, your, your disease. That would be ridiculous. So it's not just uh, welcoming. We, we do need a field hospital. We're all wounded. Uh, especially wounded by, by sin, but we go to the hospital to be cured of what afflicts us. People would uh, at times say that, uh, well, uh, Jesus just accepted the sinners. In fact, he, he was uh, always with the sinners. And he, he was nice in that way, he accepted the sinners. Yes, he did. But he told them, sin no more. And the reason he accepted the sinners and was into their company was precisely not just to be a nice person to them, but so that he could lead them 
uh, to to sin no more. Jesus did come for sinners. We read in Mark 2, verse 17, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, I like the uh, comparative reading in Luke uh, better because it's clearer. Luke 5, verse 32, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. So, Jesus came for the sinners. Jesus called the sinners, but to repentance, to, to help bring them out of their uh, sin. So that's how we are to relate to, to sinners. That's how the church ought to relate to, to sinners. That's how the church uh, always used to relate to sinners. <laughs> but now all this uh, political correctness, which is uh, just false mercy. Third aspect, relating to homosexuals. And uh, today, the uh, gays are dominant in the culture. Uh, and in the Western nations, especially, they are so overly dominant. And they are really imposing already their own culture on everyone else. So, what is right? It is right to look to the well-being of those who are gay. What is wrong? It is wrong to accept LGBT ideology. The two are different. You love the person. Love the sinner, hate the sin, right? So you love the person. So you you accept them. You, you look to their well-being. You can have friendships with them, certainly. Uh, even brotherhood and sisterhood in, in, in Christ. But it is wrong to accept the ideology. The LGBT ideology. Now, all human beings have dignity as a creation of God. And so we say, well, they should be respected. They are creation of God, you and I, no matter our uh, situation in life. Rich and poor, famous, not famous. And then those who are uh, into uh, sin or those who are practically saints. So, so all are respected because of their dignity as a creation of God. But it can never mean acceptance of sin. Acceptance of the person, but not acceptance of the sin. Okay, what's happening in the church today? Uh, it seems that there's more and more acceptance of same-sex relationships. And recently there was talk of same-sex unions, which was being accepted by, by some. And uh, they say, well, for the rights of the homosexual, for their protection. And okay, we, we understand that. We, 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 we can see that. But active homosexual relationships are intrinsically wrong. So they cannot be accepted. The homosexuals can be accepted, but their situation, their wrongful situation, their sin, their, their grievous sin can never be uh, accepted. And of course, there are many other things that are wrong with acceptance of uh, same-sex civil unions because ultimately, inevitably, I assure you, uh, they will lead to acceptance of same-sex marriage. Because some people today in the church distinguish, oh, we're not talking of marriage, we're talking of civil unions. It's the same thing, you're talking of, of grave mortal sin. And it can never be accepted by Christians, by, by the church. And then practically speaking, once you accept that, that's a slippery slope. It's going to lead to, to same-sex uh, marriage. And then, of course, things like uh, adoption of children. So if they have already a legal civil uh, relationship, so they can legally adopt children. And that's so bad for the children. Because the design of God is that a child will grow up with a male father <laughs> and a female mother who are committed to one another and who will care for them. And they, they see uh, a, a male figure and a female figure and both are complementary to each other. You cannot, you cannot have two men. You cannot have two, 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 two women. That will be uh, bad uh, emotionally for, for, for the child. And they, they grow up uh, confused and... and Maybe that's the least 
of, of the wrong things that can happen uh, to them. So the, the uh, gay LGBT ideology destroys marriage and family. And, and our church should always be against whatever destroys marriage and family. In, in the world today, because there are so many uh, gays, there are those uh, good Christians who offer what is called uh, conversion therapy. No? So I will, I will, these are psychiatrists, psychologists, and of course, uh, uh, spiritual workers. I can work with you so that uh, hopefully I can get you out of your uh, uh, gay condition. Because no one is, gay, is born gay. Uh, much of that is the effect of the culture. So uh, you, 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 you don't know any better. And the culture certainly is affirming it and, and confirming it. So there are those who do conversion therapy. They can, get, uh, they can help you. And uh, their work has been proven uh, in getting many out of their uh, homosexuality. But what is uh, the, the, the world today doing and state governments they are prohibiting conversion uh, therapy, and they are criminalizing it. If you attempt to change a gay person uh, so that that person will no longer be, be gay, you can be charged. There is a law in, in, in many different uh, countries today. Uh, there is a law, and you can be in prison. You can be uh, uh, fined for doing what is Christian. For doing something out, out of love. So that's tragic and that's simply uh, wrong. When we talk of homosexuality, LGBT, uh, lesbians, gay, bisexual, uh, transgender, the T uh, seems to be the most egregious, the, 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 the worst. And this changes the very design of God. It is totally contrary to the design of, of God. But unfortunately, uh, transgenderism is advancing rapidly throughout the world. Homosexuality, you've always said it there, from time immemorial. Even in the Old Testament, you, you have uh, homosexuality. But transgenderism is a fairly new phenomenon. Maybe just in the last uh, decade or two, but it's advancing so very rapidly and massively uh, throughout the world and being abetted by uh, the, the, legal, uh, the liberals, the progressives, the modernists, however you want to call them. Uh, for example, European Union uh, commissars are cracking down on what they call homophobia. Homophobia, of course, defined as hatred of uh, gays. And that's what they always accuse us of. If, if uh, you talk like this, ah, you, you're a homophobe, no, you're a hater. So, so they're cracking down on homophobia and they're making this uh, hate speech, which will be a crime by 2021, next year. European Union. So uh, my, my brethren in uh, Europe, uh, this will be a great uh, challenge and, and difficulty because it will be a crime if you speak in that, this way about uh, homosexuality. Uh, Norway. Uh, already outlaws uh, so-called hate speech where versus against uh, transgenders. If you speak negatively of transgenderism, then that is hate speech. If you do it privately, like maybe you're in your home, just a small circle, then someone rats on you. If you do it privately, you can be put in jail for one year. If you do it publicly, you will go to jail for three years. They're, they're really uh, clamping down on, on all of this. Uh, Scotland is promoting trans transgenderism to four-year-olds. Four-year-olds. They have a, a picture book, so it's like comics. And of course, you know how, how the, the young uh, children are. Nice uh, artwork and uh, comics. So that's how they they change the mind. That's how they indoctrinate. You know, and they're doing it at, at that very, very young, uh, innocent age. And these young kids grow up thinking, ah, oh, this is so, this is so normal. 
Uh -huh. uh, also in Scotland, uh, if you say a man cannot be a woman, <laughs> that is a hate crime. <laughs> it's so ridiculous, but it can get you in jail. <laughs> in uh, Australia, uh, recently a teenager was removed from uh, their home, the home of uh, the, the parents, because the, the parents refused to give their consent to transition. I, I'm not sure now whether it, it, it was a boy who wanted to be a girl or a girl who wanted to be a boy. So, of course, the, the parents, right thinking, uh, refused to give their consent. So the state took the teenager away from the parents. And then, of course, the, the, the state will allow that confused teenager to, to do whatever he or she wants to do with, with uh, himself or herself. Transgenderism is uh, such a great scourge, especially for women. You know, I, I want women to speak up, the normal women. They should speak up because this is really, really uh, bad for them. The transgenders can go to the women's uh, bathrooms. And there are sex offenders who are not really transgender, but they just use that as a, as a pretext. It's very dangerous. And some of them have already been sexually assaulted because of that. And then they're getting into sports, women's sports. And of course, men, uh, even though they've done some transition, they are, they are built differently. They are, they are physically uh, made differently. They are stronger. And so many transgenders are already dominating women's sports to the detriment of the real women. The women should, should cry out against that. It's so unfair, aside from being so ridiculous. Mixed martial arts. Uh, transgender women who are uh, uh, biological men have gotten themselves to mixed martial arts against, fighting against actual women. And so they get beaten up. The women get beaten up. Of course, they're just stronger. Reasons, the transgenders, uh, transgender women, again, who are biological men, uh, they are insisting that they are women, so they should be put into women's prisons. And the stupid state is agreeing with them and putting these men into women's prisons. Oh, wow. So, such uh, craziness, such... Uh, uh, so ridiculous, but so dangerous for for women. But it's so very unfortunate, brothers and sisters, that in our church today, uh, many, including pastors, are becoming uh, more gay friendly. Okay, let me move on. Uh, fourth aspect, uh, relating to sinners with regard to the Eucharist, to, to, to Mass. So we're talking of Catholics. What is right is to welcome sinners into the church and to participate in the Mass. That's just right. It's welcome. for Everyone is welcome. You're not excluded. No. But what is wrong is to give communion to those who are in grievous sin. I mean, who, who, we, we, we might not know uh, people who uh, line up for communion and, and is a fornicator, a murderer, a rapist. We, we might not know that. But for those that uh, clearly are into... Uh, uh, grievous sin and, and, and wrong, then it's wrong to give communion uh, to them. Sinners are welcome. Come to church, come to mass. That should be good for you. In fact, we are, we are all sinners. And we can go to church, we can go to, to, to mass. And in fact, as you know, when we start the Eucharist, what is the first prayer we start with? The confiteor. I confess to Almighty God. My sins. So we, we are all sinners. That, that's uh, understandable. No one is excluded from going to, to church. But it is wrong to give communion to those who are in grievous sin. It is a sacrilege. The very body and blood of Christ, that's that holy host, to give it to a known sinner. That is sacrilege. 
And then, as far as that person is concerned, it is sin being placed on top of sin. He or she is already into uh, serious wrongdoing by active homosexuality, and now uh, this sacrilege of receiving the very body and blood of Christ in a state of grievous sin, that's sin on top of sin. Is that person being helped? No. That person is sinking deeper into uh, darkness and into the mire. So if, if there's a public sinner, and there, there are many of them, uh, what also happens with that is it is a scandal to everyone else. So when, when, when people know, uh, I mean, in, in the parish, they, they know each other, this person is uh, uh, openly uh, uh, into serious sin, and many of them are, so, so people know that, and then uh, they receive communion, that is scandalous. And for people who are not scandalized, then they think it is okay. And so they themselves are misled. But it's okay to be an active homosexual, to be uh, actively uh, pro-abortion. You know? uh, look, he, he's receiving a communion. Now, uh, we sinners uh, certainly need uh, communion, and it will not be denied to us. But first, repent of serious sin. Go to confession so that that sin may be wiped away. And then you will be worthy to receive the body and blood of our, uh, our Lord. Now, it's also wrong, uh, as they do in uh, the Western world, like the, the U.S. and other places, uh, it's wrong to celebrate LGBT masses, meaning to say masses that are exclusively for LGBT and you've got the rainbow flag right there in the in the altar and, and the, the, the homilies uh, are, are uh, gay friendly and gay encouraging. They can go to regular masses. But if a parish a pastor decides now I'm going to have a, an LGBT mass to be more welcoming, <laughs> to, to be nice to these uh, uh, gays, then, in effect, he is endorsing that sin because you are welcome as you are. And I know you are into this active, of course, they, they would not call it sin probably because they've accepted uh, already. Uh, but but uh, I, I know your, your active situation of homosexuality, but you are uh, welcome. And again, they are affirmed in their sinful lifestyle. Why should they change? They have everything. They even have the Eucharist, a mass for them, a, a church that is gay friendly, uh, holy communion. Nothing is withheld. Okay. Moving on, uh, number five, uh, the whole aspect of uh, judging others. What is right is not to judge. What is wrong is not to judge. <laughs> It's both uh, uh, judging or not judging uh, can be both uh, wrong and right or right. You know? Depends on the uh, circumstance. So there are those who say, even when face to face with uh, known uh, public sinners would say, uh, who am I to, to judge? Well, it is right to judge objective wrongdoing. But what is wrong is to judge the inner disposition of the person because we don't really know. Well, we, we can perhaps presume with a high degree of uh, accuracy because of what we can see happening in the life of that person. Uh, but ultimately, we, we don't really know. But the objective wrongdoing, we can see. It is simply against the commandments of God. So it is wrong. Now, uh, when, when we talk of uh, not judging the inner disposition, for example, uh, sex outside marriage is wrong. Okay. But what if a woman is raped or uh, forced into prostitution? So that woman is engaging in sex outside marriage, but for her, I, I don't think she is culpable. 
because she's not doing it uh, freely, not even desiring to to do to do that. So uh, we 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 judge the objective situation, but we don't uh, judge the inner disposition of the person. Now, when we talk of uh, not judging, a basic uh, text for that uh, is uh, Matthew seven verse one, where it it says here, "Stop judging." that you may not be judged okay so so don't judge however if you continue reading matthew 7 uh, skipping to verses uh, 5 to 6 uh, that 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 first admonition if it's taken just as a blanket admonition outside of the contact context then uh, it is not compatible with what, what follows uh, in verses 5 to 6, Matthew 7, 5 to 6. Uh, Jesus says, You hypocrite, remove the wooden beam from my, your eye first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs or throw your pearls before swine. So, you know, you, 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 well, uh, uh, Jesus talking about you're a hypocrite because you've got a, a big log in your eye and you're seeing the splinter on the other side. But still, we judge that there is that splinter. And then when, when Jesus says, do not give what is holy to, to dogs then, or, or throw your purse before swine, we are actually judging that this person is not worthy because the situation of that person that is not in a situation of, of, of grace or living out the, 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 the faith. So it has to be in, in context. And uh, what does it mean? Well, what it means are in the verses in between. So we saw uh, Matthew 7 verse 1. We saw Matthew 7 verses 5 to 6. Now in Matthew 7 verses uh, 3 to 5, this is what Jesus says. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye? But do not perceive the wooden beam in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me remove that splinter from your eye while the wooden beam is in your eye? You hypocrite. So what, what does that mean? We are not to judge in a spirit of, of arrogance where we miss our own faults. So you can judge. You can judge objective wrongdoing, but you don't judge the inner disposition of a person. At the same time, uh, we are careful because Jesus says, judge. If you judge, you will be judged. You know? So we need to look at our own situation. Do we have a spirit of arrogance, holier than thou? You know? and, and you're the sinner, and I'm not the sinner, but we're, we're missing uh, what is actually our sin. And so we, we are hypocrites. We're missing our own uh, faults. So we can judge. We must judge at times. <laughs> Actually, see see what uh, uh, Jesus says about uh, how the church ought to deal with uh, sinners in Matthew eighteen, verses uh, fifteen to seventeen. Jesus says, uh, this is a familiar passage to you. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then Treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. So at all of those different levels, there's a point of, of judgment. So first, I, I, I have judged that my brother has sinned against me. I, I don't say, oh, oh, he did this. Uh, it, it, it's okay. You know, uh, I, I don't know what's uh, in his inner uh, disposition. Uh, no, what he did was wrong. And so my brother has sinned against me. I have made that judgment. So talk to him and, and resolve things yourselves. If that doesn't uh, 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 go well, take 
uh, one or two, uh, two, two or one or two other uh, witnesses. And what are they there for? They would also judge. They will listen to the the conversation, to the discussion, and then at some point they will give their input. Yes, uh, brother, you actually have sinned. So if the sinner still does not uh, mend, mend his ways with that, uh, tell the church, report it to the church. Now the elders of the church, uh, the leaders of the Christian community will be the one now to confront the, the sinner and get to the bottom of it. And in doing that, they make a judgment. And in fact, uh, finally, if the sinner refuses to listen even to the church, then they are to treat him as a Gentile or a tax collector, meaning to say, have nothing to do with him. Isn't that judgment? It's not just, no, no, let, let's deny it, let's accept everyone, uh, if, even this, this sinner. Uh -huh. There comes a point where uh, it, it might lead to that, uh, when we are talking of uh, grievous, grievous uh, uh, sin. So we must judge at times. And if we don't do so, uh, we will actually not be uh, acting according to biblical uh, principles. What are the various things that we, we need to do in relation to others who might do wrong, whom we judge uh, to do wrong? First, you correct one another. You, you will not correct someone whom you have not, you, you, in your mind, uh, you, you cannot decide whether the person did wrong or not. What is there to correct? So you, you correct one another. Proverbs uh, 3 verse 12, For whom, whom the Lord loves, he reproves. As a father, the son he favors. God reproves, God corrects, God uh, disciplines, and uh, we are also to uh, act in the way, you know, according to the example of uh, the, the Lord, for someone who... Uh, does wrong. In fact, we are to make use of the uh, words of God you know, in the Bible, in the scriptures. And, and of course, uh, the words of God contain authority. So it's not just me saying, brother, you did wrong. But then we, we, we can cite scripture. And it says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching for refutation, for correction, and for training in uh, righteousness. Now, what else that, that we, we, we judge according to biblical principles? We are supposed to rebuke false teaching. Unfortunately, there is much false teaching in the church today. So you don't just let it pass. But uh, you, you, you need, first of all, to judge that, hey, this false teaching. Or at least it seems to be false teaching. And what do you do about it? You rebuke that false uh, uh, teaching. Uh, we read in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 4. Paul says to Timothy, Convince, reprimand, encourage through all patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but following their own desires and insatiable curiosity, will accumulate teachers and will stop listening to the truth and will be diverted to myths. The time has already come. The time has been long with us, where many Catholics uh, no longer know sound doctrine. They don't tolerate sound doctrine. They listen to, to teachers that tickle their ears or who can affirm them in their, in their sin. Uh, who will not uh, call them out. So they're no longer listening to the truth. Yeah. What else are we supposed to do? We're to reject false gospels. Of course. We, 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 we cannot accept uh, false gospels. Galatians 1, verses 7 to 8. Paul says, There are some who are disturbing you and wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. There are. That's not just at, in Paul's time, because uh, the, that, I guess, is the work of the enemy that will always happen uh, within the church, trying to weaken or destroy the church. So today, uh, there are uh, those who are perverting uh, the gospel of Christ. They come up with 
uh, all uh, different gospels. You know? But there's only one good news of salvation in Jesus. So uh, reading on says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let that one be accursed. So of course, uh, Paul was confident that he preached the right gospel. Uh, today, we have confidence in the age-old teachings of our church, the catechism, the magisterium. So uh, that is the right uh, gospel. And he says, even if an angel from heaven should preach a, a different gospel, of course, false gospel, let that one be accursed. If that's what Paul says about an angel, then that applies to a cleric, a religious, a bishop, a cardinal. So, so uh, we 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 cannot accept uh, uh, false gospels. We are to reject them. What else? We should also reject uh, false prophets. There are many false prophets in our midst. Jesus actually said that that would be the signs of the end, uh, the rise of false prophets, and they're all around us uh, today. Uh, what do we read in 1 John 4 verse 1? Beloved, do not trust every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they belong to God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So there you, you're judging. This, this person, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, doesn't seem to be what's right. Okay, let me uh, look at the scriptures. Let me see what the church is teaching. Ah, it's totally contrary to what uh, the church has been teaching and what we accept as uh, uh, regular, uh, authoritative uh, teaching. So you, you, you test the spirits. Do they belong to God? Do they speak God's words? Are they authentic? Because there are many of those false prophets. So you, you reject false prophets. And then, and uh, this should be a, a good uh, challenge for those who just want to accept uh, even the most egregious, egregious of uh, sins. You know? Because Paul also talks about expelling the unrepentant sinner and translated into today's uh, 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 lingo uh, in, in the church, that would be uh, excommunication. So we, we, we read in his uh, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse uh, 2 and 5, there was this case of incest in the community. So this is what Paul said. The one who did this deed should be expelled from your midst. Well, it's uh, quite, quite a big difference from uh, just accept, just embrace, uh, just, you know, uh, just welcome. Uh, this one should be expelled from your midst. And then in verse 5, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. What is the purpose of expelling that person? What is the purpose of excommunication for someone in grievous sin who is persistent, who does not want to repent? You know, uh, the, the, the purpose is that ultimately when you do this strong uh, radical action, that the person will realize. We were talking before political correctness, false mercy, because people are affirmed in their sin. Well, I, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. Look, I'm accepted. So when you are expelled from the Christian community, huh, you realize, what did I do wrong? Oh, it was so wrong. Uh, then hopefully you, you, you are led to repentance. People work with you. Uh, so hopefully you will be restored. And that, that was uh, the purpose of, of that. So different from, from cuddling uh, sinners. So anyway, it's about judging others. So in ma very many instances, we must make a judgment. Okay, number six, uh, sixth aspect. I'm moving now into uh, relationships, uh, talking of uh, human fraternity. Okay, so number six, talking about religions in the world. 
it is right to have respect for other religions. It is wrong for us as Catholics to accept them as ways to the divine. You expect, accept, uh, you, you give respect that other people have different beliefs, but you don't accept their beliefs and their religion as ways to the divine. There are, uh, there certainly we know is a diversity of religions in the world today. There's so many Christianity, Judaism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and so many, many uh, others, diversity of religions. And well, people, they have free will, they're entitled to their own beliefs. So that's the sense where we uh, respect them and their uh, religion. But there, there are some in our church that claim that God wills such diversity. I, I don't know about that. God is interested, in fact, uh, why he sent his very own son into the world and, and to, to be uh, the savior. And the way that we take hold of the salvation of Jesus is when we repent of sin and to put our faith in him. And as Catholics, we are, we are baptized, accepting that, that faith. So that's what God wills. Everyone is saved. No one is lost. But you're lost in those other uh, religions. So that cannot be the, the will of God. There's only one true faith, and that is uh, Christianity. And it's uh, simply wrong to accept that other religions are uh, valid or acceptable pathways to the divine. So, in fact, uh, in our church, because we're also talking of what's happening in our, in our church, there's one bad result of accepting all religions as valid. And that is, we're being told not to proselytize. What is uh, proselytism? It is trying to make converts of, of others to our uh, religion. That's the very purpose of the church. Our church is missionary. We're sent out by Jesus to do mission and, and to, to, to make converts. Why? Because salvation is only in uh, Jesus. We, we, we see in Acts 4 verse uh, 12, it says there, there is no salvation through anyone else. Nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. Only one name. The name of Jesus. No other name. And, and, and so if they are to be saved, our task, our work, what God has given us is to proselytize, to try to make converts of them. Jesus commanded us to evangelize, proclaim the gospel, Mark 16, verse 15, go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel, uh, gospel to all of creation. And then in uh, Matthew, uh, he told us to make disciples in Matthew 28, verse 19. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is the final instructions of Jesus. That is the work of the church. That is our work. We are supposed to make converts. But today we're being told not to proselytize. Why? Well, because all religions are valid. Find your own path. It does not have to be uh, Jesus. If it's Jesus, fine. Those in the church would say. But if some others, it cannot be uh, that way. Uh, that is what you might call uh, religious indifferentism. We cannot be indifferent. Because again, there's only one true faith, and that is Christianity. Okay, number seven, talking about human fraternity. It is right to look to human fraternity, but it is wrong to look to human fraternity.
paternity. Okay, there I go again. <laughs> Saying the very same thing, but on the one hand it's wrong, on the one hand it is right. So, uh, it, it depends on what you mean by fraternity. So, yes, all uh, are members of the human race. Yes, all descended from Adam and Eve. So, we are one extended family. And, and uh, that is the sense in which you can talk about the brotherhood of all men. We're all descended from uh, uh, one one uh, parent parents, you know, Adam and, and Eve, all members of the human race. But no, not all our are brethren in Christ or children of God. So we are we are brothers descended from Adam and Eve, but you cannot extend that and say, uh, okay. We are all brethren in Christ. Or that, or even that we are all children of God. Why? Children of God are those who believe. Those who believe. Uh, John 1 verse 12. But to those who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Accept who? Jesus Christ. Believe in whose name? The name of Jesus. That is, uh, then when, when you do that, then you become children of, of God. Galatians 3, verse 26. For through faith, you are all children of God in Christ Jesus. We are children of God because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And then further... Uh, talking about being led by the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Not those who are led by other spirits. There are so many other spirits out there and so many, many other gods with a small g. But there's only one God. There's only one Holy Spirit of God. And if we are led by the Spirit of God, that's what makes us children of, of God. So, so-called brethren, brothers and sisters, are those who are in Christ. Even blood brothers, your, 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 blood, your siblings, my, my siblings, are not necessarily brothers in Christ. If they have not accepted Jesus, if they, they, they go to other uh, religions, oh, you are blood brothers, but you're not brothers in Christ. So the, the, the way that the church has uh, looked uh, on, on uh, people in, in the world, uh, the, the, the Christians are the people of God. The non-Christians are outsiders. And, and again, uh, we look to convert them, to proselytize so that they can become children of God. So that they can uh, join the authentic brotherhood in uh, Christ. We look to convert them. In Colossians 4 verse 5, Paul says, Conduct yourselves wisely towards outsiders. So the non-Christians are outsiders. You know? Making the most of the opportunity. What is that opportunity? Well, uh, two verses before that in verse 3, he says, Pray for us too that God may open a door for us for the word to speak of the mystery of Christ. So Paul was asking for prayers. I'm out to evangelize. I'm out to make uh, converts. So please uh, pray for me uh, that God will open a door, that there will be an opportunity, that they will speak about Christ and the mystery of, of Christ. And then uh, later on, two verses down, he tells uh, the, the uh, Colossians, uh, the way you are conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. That's why we are in the world. We relate to others. We make friends. And, and uh, uh, as, as Christians who, who know the commission of Jesus, we ought to be looking for that opportunity by which we can speak about Christ so as to 
uh, help bring them to to conversion. So that, that that's where you have a, a difference when we talk of uh, human paternity. We are to relate well with all Christians and non-Christians uh, alike. Uh, remember, we even love our enemies. So how much more if they're not our enemies? They belong to other faiths, but we relate well with them. And we, we do so not because they are brothers in Christ, but because God loves them. And that's what God expects uh, of, of uh, Christians. Okay, uh, moving on. Eighth aspect, talking about unity among all men. So these are uh, related to that whole aspect of human fraternity. Now, unity among all men. What is right is for us to look to peace and unity among, among everyone. What is wrong is to fellowship with Beliar or Beelzebub. So we, we are to... First of all, live in peace with, with, with all. Romans 12, verse 18, Paul says, If possible, on your part, live at peace with all. Now, it's not always possible. There are those who are really hard to get along with, and you're better off uh, keeping your distance. But if possible, live, live at peace with, with, with all. Uh, Jesus, after all, is the Prince of Peace. And we're even told that uh, someone strikes you on uh, your uh, right uh, on your on your cheek, then you are to turn the other cheek. We are not to uh, retaliate. We have that option. Uh, if it's a personal injury, that we don't uh, retaliate. But we are not to be yoked with unbelievers because you can take it too far okay i'm supposed to be at peace with all uh, i'm supposed to turn the other cheek so that means uh, just just uh, have have uh, strive really to have great relationships no matter what uh, no matter the situation of the other person uh, but but we are told do not be yoked with unbelievers we we see this in second letter of paul to the corinthians chapter 6 verses 14 to 16, where he says, do not be yoked with those who are different, with unbelievers. For what partnership do righteousness and lawlessness have? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Oh, so, so many comparisons, but clearly, uh, Paul is is laying laying it down. It's darkness and light. Light can try to to dispel the darkness, but if darkness remains, no, the the two uh, just are totally opposed to each other. You, you cannot have both light and darkness as one. They are they mutually exclude each other. So you don't you don't have fellowship with with uh, those who are into unrighteousness or, or lawlessness uh, because of what we are what are we uh, uh, moving on the ver uh, we, with the reading verses uh, 16 to 17 for we are the temple of the living god as god said i will live with them and move among them and i will be their god and they shall be my people therefore come forth from them and be separate says the Lord, and touch nothing unclean, then I will receive you. So it is God in covenant with us and saying, I will be your God, you will be my people, but I'm holy. You need to be holy as well. And of course, we, we are all sinners, but but we we have basically repented. We put our faith in Jesus. Uh, hopefully we're striving to be holy, but there are those who are just uh, 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 persistent sinners who, who do not want to repent. And, and, and God is saying that, well, if, if we are to be uh, together, then uh, you cannot be in that uh, intimate relationships or fellowship with, with those others. So it, it's about who we are and, and what we are called to be. Uh, the temple of the living God, the, 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 the holy God. So... 
what does this say about what's happening in our church? Uh, people of different faiths coming together and saying a common prayer. Now, I'm not talking about the Christian praise, the Christian prayer, the Hindu praise, the Hindu prayer. It's people of different faiths saying a common prayer. Basic question, who are we praying to? We pray to our God, but those of other religions who are saying a common prayer that we all agreed on, uh, who are they praying to? They're certainly not praying to our God. How can we say a common prayer? It, it, it cannot be. So all of this have to do with globalist value. We, we talk so much about uh, uh, the, the globalist. Uh, we talked before about the French Revolution that led to the Enlightenment uh, or the Enlightenment uh, caused the French Revolution and they had the principles of uh, uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité uh, and that fraternity about uh, human fraternity but uh, the way that the world understands that, uh, the, the liberal outlook on that it is talking about universal brotherhood. Again, the brotherhood of all uh, men. But but uh, that that brotherhood that uh, they are promoting, and unfortunately, people in the church uh, get into that. But that brotherhood of man that eliminates distinction on the basis of religion. So since we're all brothers, it's not just talking about. Uh, how can we work together to, to resolve uh, criminality or, or, or wars and all that? That would be fine. We can, we can work on that. But it eliminates uh, all distinction on the basis of religion. And again, you get back to all religions are fine. All religions are ways to the, to the divine. This is a pre-Masonic principle. The universal ecumenism of religions. That's what the uh, Freemasons uh, believe in. Who is their God? The great architect of the universe. And who is the great architect of the universe? Well, if you're a Christian, it's Yahweh God. If you're uh, a, a Muslim, it's Allah. If you're uh, another religion, then it's whatever God it is that you that you worship. It's fine. It's the great architect of the, the, the universe. So that's just not right. We can work together on social issues, but there can never be such unity in the spiritual dimension. We cannot have that kind of uh, fellowship uh, or unity with, uh, uh, in, in the spiritual realm with those of other religions. Okay, moving on. And, and this uh, next few uh, aspects uh, in relation to social justice. So number nine, I'm in my number ninth aspect, there are 13, so we're running out of time. <laughs> uh, social justice. What is right is to look to social justice issues, be involved. What is wrong is to put the social justice issues over or of more importance than morality and righteousness. So in our church, we have a preferential option for the poor, and that's totally right. Uh, God loves the poor. And Jesus told the parable about the last judgment, where the criterion for whether you go to heaven or to hell is what you did for the least of my brethren or what you did not do. And uh, Jesus identifies with, uh, with the poor. But, okay, don't misunderstand me in this. This is not actually the priority. It is a priority, but it is not the priority. Because the priority is salvation. It is, it is uh, not, not uh, a salvation from poverty, but it is salvation from sin. Poverty will not get you to, 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 to hell. That, that uh, parable of uh, Lazarus and the rich uh, man, Lazarus went up to, to heaven. He died very, very poor and neglected, but he went up to, to heaven. But uh, 
if, if you are into serious sin when you die, then you go to hell. You don't go to, to heaven. So that was that is the most uh, important. And what good is it if the poor are helped, but they lose their souls? So first things first. Priority is personal transformation and living in Christ. And then if you are an authentic Christian, if you uh, read the Bible, if you know what is at the heart of God, uh, the love of God for the poor, the preferential option for the poor, then if you're an authentic Christian, then you will help the poor. That follows naturally. But it's not the other way around. There are many who, well, they say they help the poor, uh, but uh, they are into serious unrighteousness. So uh, first things first, even when we look at the first Christian community uh, after Pentecost, we see that uh, they were into formation, Acts 2, verse uh, 42. Uh, the, the tools to growth, actually. Uh, they, they were into, into prayer, into uh, sacraments, into uh, uh, communal life, and of course, the instruction of the apostles. What, what does all of that do? To, to make them uh, understand the faith. You know? So they grow in their life in Christ. That is most important. Now, in our CLS, we know that there's a fifth tool to go, and that is service. But here in Acts 2, verse 42, talking about the four, which has to do with personal formation in Christ. But then we see, if you read further, then they actually serve, and they serve the poor among them. You know? and, and in fact, because of uh, their, their love for the poor and caring for uh, people in the community, there was no one in need. So, priority first. Your transformation in Christ and then the good work uh, with the list of our brethren should follow. Uh, take a look at the first church council, the council in, in Jerusalem. Uh, we read in Galatians uh, 2. So uh, they, they had their council, uh, the, the elders of the church with uh, Peter and, and Paul. And what did they basically agree on? What is briefly described in Galatians 2? The evangelization of the world. When their decision was, okay, Peter, uh, you go to the Jews, Paul, you go to the Gentile. But the, the, the basic work was the evangelization of the work. And then you read in Galatians 2 verse 10, uh, it says there, only we were to be mindful of the poor. So the most basic is to proclaim the gospel, to evangelize, to bring people to Christ. But when you do that, do not forget, do not neglect the poor. So you, you see, you know, what is uh, the, the greater priority there, even though both are priorities? Unfortunately, today, it's more of uh, the greater priority for many is social justice. And again, if, if that was uh, in line with, uh, together with uh, transformation in Christ, then fine. That's how it should be. But if it's just that, if it's at the expense of morality and the righteousness of God, then it is not right. Today we have so many so-called uh, social justice warriors, and that's all they, they, they talk about. They're into immigration and climate change, but they don't speak as much uh, against abortion or LGBT. Then there are those in the church that suppose, uh, support the United Nations uh, Social Development Goals, SDGs, and on the surface that's, that's uh, nice. There are so many things that are there, but Part of it is also the whole aspect of reproductive health, which means pushing abortion and condoms and LGBT. You know, our church can never support that. But there's blanket support you know, because it's thinking about all the other supposedly good things that uh, the United States would be doing through these uh, social development goals. Uh, in, in, in the U.S., what's been happening there, there's support for Black Lives Matter. Because they're saying, oh, racial injustice, and uh, people have different views whether that's uh, really a reality. But even let's say that it is re a, a reality. But uh, they ought to see that Black Lives Matter is uh, about anarchists who want to destroy the established order, who resort to, to violence. They're burning uh, the, the, the cities down. You know? And, and uh, that, that, that can never be a Christian. You don't work for racial injustice by doing that. You know? and, and bring about even greater injustice. Uh, 
they actually want to overthrow the state. They are Marxists. But there you have the the even even the bishop uh, uh, kneeling down with a big Black Lives Matter sign before him. Then there is the proposal for a uh, universal basic income (UBI). Well, uh, not the time to get into all of that uh, now. But what basically it is, it's a handout. Give everyone the certain amount, uh, and they don't need to work. <laughs> this is totally contrary to biblical principles. Paul says, if you do not work, you do not eat. No? And and of course, when you have something like that, uh, most people will prefer not to work. I just get something, and I just enjoy my life. Uh, so that 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 is uh, not not uh, right. No? Uh, it's, a, it's a socialist idea. Uh, communist idea that does not even work. And then there are those who, talking about social justice, are against the death penalty. Uh, but the death penalty has always been accepted by the church. We don't desire it. We hope that uh, it does not have to happen. But if, if uh, for, for uh, whatever valid reasons, there are valid reasons where it can happen. It's always been accepted in the catechism of the, of the church. And then, of course, those who are against the death penalty, what do they say about that most egregious death penalty, which is abortion? They don't say anything, or hardly, hardly much. So there are a lot of errors here when you talk of uh, social justice. Uh, the, the U.S. bishops, and I think in March of the Church, they uh, accept what is called the seamless garment uh, I don't know, theory, philosophy, uh, seamless garment. Meaning to say, if you talk about pre being pro-life, you shouldn't just talk about abortion, but you ought to talk about all aspects of, of, of life. You know? And that means to say, you look at uh, uh, climate change, you look at uh, immigration, you know? and certainly we can look at uh, all of those basic things, but you don't put it on the same level. It is not on the same level as abortion. Abortion is the worst uh, example of being anti-life. And, and, and you, you cannot just uh, put everything on the, on the same level. But that's what some people in the church, in bishops in, in the U.S. Uh, do. They put it on the same level. And so they justify uh, supporting pro-abortion candidates simply because they are they think alike when it comes to immigration or, or climate change. And, and, and uh, it, it, it just uh, cannot, cannot be uh, that way. You know? So uh, the claim to be uh, pro-life, you know, they're saying that, well, you, know, you, you need to help the poor. And at times when they have the poor, they support abortion. They, they justify. So it's not just putting uh, social justice issues on the same level. It's even downgrading issues of morality and righteousness, like, like uh, abortion. So to, uh, today, Okay. By, by the way, you, when, you, when you talk of uh, uh, the seamless garment, oh, you can stretch that uh, too much. When you say that everything about, is about life, you can justify everything as being about life. So, uh, for example, uh, one bishop told me before that uh, boxing is not pro-life because people hurt one another. And that, that, that certainly can be accepted. Where does that put you and now you enjoy uh, <laughs> price fighting? You know, where we don't, what, what, what we see is a, a, a valid sport you know, uh, that brings out the, the best in people as far as uh, they, they're, that particular sport. It's not necessarily condoning violence. But where does it stop? So... I, I, I love action movies, and I, I, I know many of you do as well. But when you have action movies, then there's uh, killing, there's violence. Oh, that's not pro-life. 
So we should avoid all, all action movies where there's killing and there's violence. Why does it stop? Now, you, you can argue about uh, all of those other things, but there's a hierarchy and, and abortion is the most, uh, most uh, basic. And this seamless garment theory just became a justification for downplaying abortion and raising up all these other uh, social justice warrior uh, issues. So uh, in looking to social justice, Christ first, then everything else follows. You live Christ, then you will share Christ. You love Christ, then you will love the poor. But we must never violate morality or the righteousness of God. Okay, let me move on to uh, my, my tenth uh, aspect, which is about the environment. What is right is to care for the environment. What is wrong is to promote climate change, alarmism, and hysteria. No. Uh, God, God gave man dominion over uh, creation. Again, in, in Genesis 1, verse 28, uh, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and so on. So take care of my creation. That's what uh, God, God is saying. Uh, in fact, in the second story of creation, uh, Genesis 2, we are, uh, the, uh, Adam is to care for uh, God's creation. In Genesis 2, verse 15, the Lord God then took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden, to cultivate and care for it. So, unfortunately, we have uh, done a uh, really bad job <laughs> about the care of creation. And people who are concerned about that, uh, very, very valid. But what is not valid is uh, uh, when we talk of uh, climate change, with the, which uh, so, so many people are talking about today and they've been indoctrinated, what is not, what is not uh, valid is climate change hysteria. Now let me tell you, as I've said even from before, climate does change. It is natural. The warming, the cooling, the, the cycles through, through the ages, that is natural. It has happened before. It will continue to happen. But the world will not end due to climate change, even given what is done, being done today. Now, the, I, I agree there are many things that can be done. So we have less pollution and care for the environment and all of that. But what is happening... Uh, will not cause the world to end. There have been many, many dire predictions over the past decades and up, up to today. And all of those predictions have not come to pass. Our world should have uh, been destroyed long, long ago, so many times with these predictions. Uh, but no, that, that, that is not going to, to pass. In fact, uh, the, the, what, what uh, the, Liberals and progressives were talking about before was global warming. But then when it was not happening in some places, the world was even cooling. Uh, so they changed it to climate change. That's safe. Because whether it, it cools or it warms, climate is changing. But what is it really about, this climate change hysteria? It, it has to do with the globalist agenda. It has to do with population control. Because at the end of the day, uh, these globalists are saying human beings are the cause for all, all of this. And uh, there are many aspects that we need to realize what is actually the, the truth from what is being told to us and how, our, how, how the young have been indoctrinated. First of all, uh, the myth of carbon pollution. If we do burn carbon, we do emit uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, but that is not a pollutant. In fact, carbon dioxide is the miracle plant food that makes life on Earth possible. If there is no carbon dioxide, we wouldn't have you know, all, all this greenery that are around us. And then the climate change hysteria has been saying uh, every time uh, the world will run out of food, out of land, out of uh, fuel. That is not the case. 
Today, we have more food because of better uh, production uh, technologies. Uh, and, and land, there is lots of land. If you're in a plane, you can see in any, any country. You know? If you're just in the city, you think we're so congested. But when you fly, you see there's plenty of empty space. Uh, fuel, they're discovering more and more. Uh, so we were not running out of food, land, and fuel. Uh, that, that's not happening. Now, even when we talk about global warming, warming is not necessarily bad. Because warming, if it melts, now people are always saying, oh, the glaciers are melting, and the uh, ice caps, and so on and so forth. And of course, we don't want that to happen. But if, if, if there is warming, then that can open up lands for farming. For example, more food. Just consider, think of Siberia. You know, uh, Siberia in, in Russia, you see Russia, very, very, very big, big, big country. But a lot of that is uh, Siberia. It's, it's snow, it's, it's ice. What if part of that? Uh, the, the, the snow melted, then that would open up to, to farming for food. You know? And then when you talk about uh, warming, that might mean less mortality for old people. Because scientifically, more people, more old people die of cold in the winter than heat in the summer. So they're, 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 they're these things. But, you know, there's this uh, agenda, the globalist agenda, because there are trillions of dollars at stake. 1.5 trillion dollars per year. This is for research money, uh, renew renewable energy subsidies. And then, of course, there are those who, who look to power, to prestige, to uh, wealth redistribution schemes, uh, the, the dreams of the new world order. So you have all of these things already coming in, but it's big money. Actually, the well, one big problem is in the world, 1.2 billion people have no access to electricity. And because of that, uh, life is bad for them. In fact, that no access to electricity is the chief cause of mortality in the third world. Because they have no electricity. They're living in huts and they're, they're cooking and there's that, that smoke and, and all the other things that, that happen. Now, how can electricity be provided? The first world is talking about, you know, we don't like coal because coal is dirty. That, that can be disputed with technologies uh, now. But they, they can afford, they can uh, build uh, uh, solar panels and wind turbines and, and, and uh, um, uh, water power and do all of that. But how about the third world? The cheapest is coal-powered coal plants. But that can go a long, long way. But if you ban all of this, you know, that, that's good for these globalists who are all uh, elites, the rich elites. And it never affects them. But how about the, the poor of the world? And then there's a claim that the science is settled. That's what they always say. No, the science is settled. That's, that's a lot of bull. <laughs> the science is not settled. Uh, they, they claim that uh, there's a scientific consensus, 97% of all scientists, which is just a big blatant lie. There was uh, before an overview of uh, almost 12,000 papers from uh, eminent uh, scientists and asking about this whole aspect and 66% had no opinion. Only 4% actually responded and that's where they, they get the 97% figure. 97% of the 4% that responded, you know, they, they are uh, into this uh, climate change. Uh, global warming, uh, hysteria, and other mission. So they say the science is settled. No, it's not. That's a very, very small uh, percentage. In fact, the great, greater majority of scientists do not agree uh, with all the garbage that they've been putting forth. And of course, there are practical implications for this when you, because you can have ridiculous uh, results. Uh, people don't want to have children because that they think that's just to uh, co co uh, contribute to the problems and uh, our uh, carbon footprint and so on and so forth. They don't want to have children. 
And uh, there are those who don't want to take showers. <laughs> you don't like to make use of the the limited, uh, supposedly, resources of, of clean water. There are those who want to de-industrialize. And the consequences of that would be uh, terrible. Yes, try to clean up those plants, but uh, you don't get rid of all, all industry. There are those who want to shut off pipelines, but uh, some of these pipelines are for for gas and gas uh, very clean uh, energy. Uh, there are those who don't want to to eat meat, and this uh, ridiculous uh, congresswoman in the U.S. who who said that cow fart <laughs> produce CO two. So how do we prevent that? Well, get rid of all the cows. So if, if people don't eat meat, then there will be no demand for cows. We can get rid of all the cows and there's no cow fart. <laughs> there's no carbon dioxide. Ridiculous. The enemy of the environment is not poverty. Uh, it's poverty. Uh, it is not people. Because uh, poor people in the provinces, they, they will cut the trees for fuel because they don't have fuel. Uh, they might uh, pollute uh, the, the water because they cannot dig uh, artesian wells or build uh, sewage uh, treatment facilities. So the water, through constant use, uh, eventually becomes polluted. Uh, they might cut down trees and burn forests to clear land for farming. So uh, the, the enemy of the environment is poverty. So that's what we... Uh, need to look for, look, look to. But the way to uh, resolving that is not by penalizing the very poor, poor people themselves, the people who we want to, to, to help. So, yes, let us care for the environment, but there is no climate emergency. There is no cause for hysteria. In fact, uh, I think we can, we can uh, see in... Uh, Genesis 8, verses 21 to 22. This was after the flood. And this is God's assurance. Now remember, God's word is eternal. Okay, So this was after the flood. And we read in Genesis 8, verses 21 to 22. God said, Never again will I curse the ground because of human beings. Since the desires of the human heart are evil from youth, nor will I ever again strike down every living being as I have done. All the days of the earth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. All the days of the earth, including cold and heat, cooling or warming, Summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. That will simply go on and, and on. So, brothers and sisters, don't worry about uh, climate change. Let's do whatever it, we, we can in order to take care of the environment. But let's not get into alarmism or hysteria. And let's not believe all this garbage that uh, is being foisted on us. And so many have already been indoctrinated. This is the work, this is the work of the globalists the depopulationists. Okay, number 11, 11th aspect, ecology. What's the difference between environment and ecology? Well, environment is our natural surroundings. The trees, the water, you know, sunlight, so our natural surroundings. Ecology is the study of our environment. It's uh, the interrelationships of all the elements of the uh, environment. Now, it is right to look to ecological concerns, but it is wrong to fall into pantheism. What is pantheism? It is equating God with the forces of the universe. It identifies God and nature, that, that they are one, that God exists in and is the same as all things, animals, people within uh, the universe. And that Jesus is present in, in uh, rivers, in trees, uh, in, in the fish, in the wind. 
That, that, that is not uh, authentic uh, Catholic teaching. That's pantheism. Where again, God with the forces of the universe, that God and, the, and, and nature are, are one. Now, God certainly created a wonderful universe, but that universe is not God. But there are those who, who worship, for example, Mother Earth. She is called uh, Gaia, G-A-I-A, -A, uh, Mother Earth. And, and what, what does Paul uh, say? In Romans 1, verses 23 to 25, he, he says, uh, They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the likeness of an image of mortal man or of birds, or of four-legged mammal animals, or of snakes. Therefore, God handed them over to impurity through the lusts of their hearts for the mutual degradation of their bodies. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and revered and worshipped the creature rather than the creator. But if God and the universe are the same, then you worship God, you worship elements of the universe. It's fine. It's wrong. It, 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 it cannot be uh, that, that way. Yeah. And because of that, because, we, because people uh, no longer really worship God or understand what it means to worship God, but they're there without, without probably knowing. They are worshiping uh, nature and saying, I see the divine in, in, in nature. Then... Paul says they are led to uh, degrading passions. And that's why we, we do have homosexuality, uh, child sacrifice, uh, temple prostitution, all that kind of thing, we, which uh, have to do with the worship of Mother Earth. Recently, even in the Vatican, when we had the uh, Amazon Synod, uh, there was a whole issue of the Pachamama, this is a wooden uh, statue of a pregnant uh, woman, uh, uh, supposed to be Mother Earth, but that 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 statue is an idol, pure and simple. And and there were people going around with with the Pachamama at the center, down to it. What were they doing? They were worshiping that that idol, and that was simply wrong. Okay. Aspect number 12, immigration, immigrants, another big, big uh, issue. And in the world today, there are so many uh, movements, um, immigrants, especially going into Europe. What is right is to welcome and care for refugees. I distinguish between refugees and immigrants. No. So it's right to welcome and care for refugees, but it is wrong to just open your borders to illegal uh, immigrants. What is biblical is to care for the oppressed, for the homeless, for the stranger. In the Old Testament, we see we are supposed to care for them. So we, we must be open to, to welcome them. But that does not mean that you just... Open your doors wide, come one, come all. When you talk of immigration, people wanting to move from one country to another country, it should be legal immigration. Now, let, 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 me, let me ask you. you, you have your home. Is it right for anyone to just enter your home, uh, open your refrigerator, cook himself a meal, help himself to your, to your bed, to your clothes, and all of that? Consume your stuff. Is that right? Will you accept that? No, of course not. We should help the poor, but that is not the way to help the poor. By saying, open doors. Just come in. Uh, do what you want to do. There are many negatives of uh, open borders. Uh, first, it's the threat to the security of a nation. Just as it would be a threat to your home if some stranger just, just uh, came in. Threat to the security of a nation by having so many uh, uh, criminals and terrorists or whatever. Second, it's a threat to the economic stability if there is a flooding of migrants. 
people might actually come. Uh, they, they will come to, to a country that is uh, well off, where things are good, and they will flood into that country. And of course, when they do that, then that country is no longer as well off, uh, having so many poor people in their midst and with all the uh, uh, crimes that would uh, happen uh, through that. Now, what else? Open borders. There will be a cultural conflict if migrants just come in and do not integrate into society. Legal immigration should mean that, okay, you want to come into this country. Okay, uh, there's a certain culture here. You need to learn the culture and inculturate. It doesn't mean to say you will give up your, say, uh, religion or your, your, your ways of uh, living with your family, but there's a particular culture, you inculturate. Uh, otherwise, there will be cultural conflict. Then, of course, you have when you talk of uh, open borders, uh, places like uh, Europe, where they experience a great influx of, of uh, migrants. And, and now they, they have started to close their borders because they see that it doesn't really work out well. And these migrants are not integrating. But also, uh, we need to be aware of the Islamist plan for world conquest and they're not no longer to do it by the sword today, they're going to do it by immigration. It's, it's an uncontrolled uh, invasion that, that is uh, uh, happening. So that, that of course is a, a great challenge to any uh, nation. And then of course, when you talk of open borders that is advancing the uh, new world order, it wants to abolish uh, nationalism. Borders, there should be no borders. There should be uh, one world under a one world government with a one world religion. And of course, run by these unelected elites, these globalists who actually have disdain for poor people and who wants to propagate the culture of, of death. So open borders will just result in demographic and uh, cultural suicide. It's not something that is uh, right. Okay, uh, my, my last uh, aspect having to do with uh, the poor and the rich. It is right to look to the poor and the weak. We've already uh, seen that. That's a very Christian virtue. But in doing so, it is wrong to condemn the rich. Now, you can condemn the, the bad rich, but there are also bad poor but per se, because you are rich, then I condemn you because I, I want to look, look to the well-being of uh, the poor and, and the weak. So in, in the church today, we uh, hear about the so-called uh, universal destination of goods. I think that is correct in concept. We are all stewards. Everything belongs to God. But how do you live that out? That's where the, the crunch comes in. The way for the early church was uh, stewardship and sharing. Remember it says in Acts 2, Acts 4, they held everything in common and no one claimed anything as his own. So that's, that's stewardship. And whenever there was so, someone in need, the, the rich sold their lands, laid the money at the feet of the, the apostles. Apostles, it was distributed to those who were in need. So that's what happened in the first Christian community. And the result, no one was in need. They actually solved the problem of uh, poverty. No. But even when we look at uh, the first Christian community, there is the uh, importance of uh, private property. Because uh, those who are looking at the universal destination of goods and uh, stewardship uh, are generally against private property. There should be none of that, uh, this is mine, uh, this is uh, my own. But public property is church teaching. It's always been accepted by church teaching. In fact, very interestingly, because we talk of Acts 2 and Acts 4, uh, they shared, no one was in need. But in Acts 5, there is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And they were a rich couple. Uh, they sold a, a piece of property and part of that they laid, uh, they gave, uh, laid at the feet of uh, Peter, but they withheld part of it, and they lied. Uh, when when Peter asked uh, them, uh, "Is this the full amount that you sold the land for?" and they said yes, you know? so that that was a a, a lie. 
And because of that, uh, Ananias uh, dropped dead at the feet of Peter and then uh, Sapphira followed. But then what, what is said there in Acts 5 uh, verses uh, 1 to 4, uh, Peter told Ananias, did, did this land not belong to you when it was unsold? There you are, private property. Even after having said they, they held everything in common, they considered uh, nothing as their own, so that's stewardship, but they had private property. Peter told Ananias, did not this land belong to you before it was sold? And then Peter further said, and when it was sold, did you not have control of the money? So the, the, the sin of Ananias and later uh, Sapphira was that they lied. They said, this is the full amount. When it would have been perfectly okay if they said, well, I withheld some of the amount, you know, I want to buy some things, but here it is, what I'm giving to the, uh, for the poor. That would have been fine. But they lied. So they, they, uh, they, their lives were poor feet. In fact, when you talk of uh, poor and rich, who else will help the poor? It's those who, who, who have goods. Uh, it, it's the so-called uh, rich. If everyone were the same, and, and uh, how, how, how can the, the poor be helped? So when you talk of rich and poor, you, the, the error is in looking into what we call uh, egalitarianism. Uh, egalitarianism is the, the uh, philosophy that all people are equal, and so there should be equality in social, political, economic affairs. Now, all of us are equal in worth and dignity. But uh, God does not intend for all to be equal uh, in social standing, in uh, political power, uh, in uh, economic uh, wealth or poverty. To each his own, as God wills. And, and, and you know, uh, even in the scriptures, you know, God warns about, about uh, the rich. It's hard for them to enter in the kingdom of heaven. You cannot serve God and mammon. So uh, you cannot just presume that, oh, to be rich is better than to be, to be, to be poor. So uh, we are not equal. That is not God's intent. Because that's more like socialism or even uh, communism. Wow, it's uh, 10 to 10. Okay, let me make my conclusion. Uh, there's lots of confusion in our church. There's a lot of false teaching, and this is weakening the faith uh, and the church. So three things we, we should do. One, uh, know the truth. You need to study. Part of it is I, I try to help out with my uh, limited knowledge, but you yourself. Uh, there's a lot that you can learn on your own, and there are many sources. So, so you, you, you study. Uh, uh, there, there's lots of uh, information, and there's uh, also alternative church media. I said alternative because official church media will just say the nice things and will never get into the controversy. Uh, that's how these whole things about uh, uh, homosexual clerical uh, predation uh, turned out to be so so bad and people did not know because uh, Catholic media will not just report on that, but alternative media is there. So you you know the truth, yeah, you 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 study. Secondly, if our pastors are wrong, correct them. If you have a relationship with them, go and correct them. That's a loving thing to do. So, and if need be, rebuke them. We, we've talked so much about lay empowerment. We've talked about being uh, the ministry of Jesus as a baptized Catholic, of priest, prophet, and king. Be prophetic. This is about our church. This is about the well-being of, of, of Catholics and hopefully uh, the, the world as well. So this is Jesus' church. This is our, our church. And uh, in the, the scriptures, we've already been warned about uh, predatory wolves that will try to devour the flock and there will be false prophets and false teachers. And unfortunately today that enemy is already with it. So, so speak up. And then thirdly, as missionary families of Christ, we rise in defense of faith, family, and life. And we need to be 
uh, holy warriors. <laughs>